Well, I've been involved in refugee and immigrant advocacy for more than three decades in America. And the first populist backlash that we experienced in the early to mid 1990s was ferocious. And we realized as the media started to cover us as right wing politicians began to exploit the issue that we were not ready for prime time. When, when I used to go out on television, I would say things that would appeal to a very narrow base of support that we had and actually alienate people in the middle. When we first did public opinion research, the woman who managed the project sat me down and said, Frank, with the messages you're using, you should be working for the other side because you alienate more people than you persuade. It was confronting, but it was also a moment of truth for us to realize that we needed to figure out how to connect with people who in the, are in the middle. They're not tabula rasa. They don't have a blank slate that we're implanting facts. And then when they hear our facts, they'll be convinced. They're people who have mixed views and strongly held views, even if they're contradictory. We need to speak to them in a way that activates their more positive views, that addresses their more negative views, so that they begin to move in a more positive direction. We became much more pragmatic, much more effective. We emboldened politicians who wanted to be on our side. We showed them how to speak about this. And the result was that the pro-immigrant movement and its supporters in the political class became much uh, more powerful in their communications and much more effective as advocates. Well, you can start by talking to people in your family who uh, have views that are different than your own and see what, uh, what their views are. Um, but the, for me, the most important thing is to do public opinion research so you flip the lights on, so you actually see what's motivating people. I know for us in America, what we learned is that people are not nearly as hardline anti-immigrant and racist as I had assumed they were. And when you see that, you realize that people are having an argument and it's a legitimate argument for many people, not the hardline haters. But most people are just saying, wait a minute, immigrants and refugees work hard, but do they take too much in benefits? Do they hurt workers in our society? Are they going to become Americans? This is the American context, of course. And so um, when you realize that they're having an argument in their head, you can engage that argument and give them the most persuasive messages that begin to move them in a more positive direction. So for me, it's about knowing where they are, meeting them where they are, addressing them respectfully, but also quite forcefully, both with here are the best arguments, but also let's elevate this debate. For me, the real turbocharging uh, component of communications is to talk about uh, uh, national identity and national values in a way so that even if the person we're talking to doesn't care that much about refugees and immigrants, that even if they're having an argument in their head, they do care about their country and they care about its, its uh, values, its principles, and its future. What we've done best is finally, instead of having a near civil war between the insiders and the outsiders, is talk about the fact that we're a movement where we have players on the team playing different positions so that we value the, the, the militancy uh, of grassroots groups and others who are using confrontational tactics to fight for justice and for rights. And we value the people who are reaching out to unusual allies and working with members of Congress and trying to come up with ways that will allow them to defend refugees and immigrants and get reelected. So we're interested in trying to find ways in which we can value all of the different approaches and keep them under one big tent. Well, having done this work for 30 years, I can tell you there's not a silver bullet. There's not one combination of words that's going to be the key that unlocks the door to people's hearts and minds. So it's, it's a combination of things. So number one, you have to put communications first. You have to actually make it a priority. Yes, you need policy work. Yes, you need services. Yes, you need organizing. Yes, you need to build power. But it all has to be in the service of a narrative that is compelling that actually uh, mobilizes your base and persuades the anxious middle. So that's for us when we finally figured out that we, the, the civil war we used to have in America was 
we should speak to the middle, and that's and that's and unless we speak to the middle, we're going to lose. And others would say, yeah, but if we don't speak to our base, we're not going to build power, and we're not going to be stronger. And our answer to that is yes, we need to do both. In fact, we add a third component, which is to try to define the radicalism of our opponents. That in fact, those who want to uh, keep out Muslims and stop refugees and deport immigrants in America the hardliners who see them as something less than human, that yes, that is a, a radicalism that is not consistent with the American creed of welcoming refugees and immigrants. So we're very uh, interested in putting together strategies that mobilize and expand our base, that persuade the anxious middle, and that define our opponents, all in service of a narrative that says, as a country, who we've been and who we're becoming is better than the kind of xenophobic populism that has gotten such traction in America. What we didn't do was address the concerns of people in the anxious middle. And in fact, Trump was able to tap into the anxieties and the fears about terrorism and too many immigrants in a way that, um, quite frankly, I think we didn't do our job of speaking to both the base and to the middle. Nevertheless, we now have a president who's determined to deport millions of immigrants, to ban Muslims, to keep out refugees, to slash legal immigration levels. It's the most xenophobic agenda we've ever dealt with um, in our lifetime. And so we're really up against it. And once again, we have to figure out how to define our opponents, how to make sure that we're winning over the middle, independent voters, reluctant Trump voters, conservative Democrats, and how to really mobilize beyond our base so that you see the women who participate in the Women's March and the citizen activism in America that's extraordinary, how to make immigration a priority for them. It's hard to, to communicate about these very controversial issues. It, 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 this is an issue that generates more heat than light. And so um, oftentimes we think, well, let's make it cool and rational. We'll give facts and that will persuade people. My experience is that this is a hot issue. Let's address people where they live. What do they care about? What do they value? Values unite, issues divide. If we can find common values and then contextualize the issue debate within those values, I think we're on much stronger ground. So I'm interested in advocates getting on the front foot, speaking to values, putting policy debates in the context of those values, making sure that people understand that immigrants and refugees share our values in terms of hard work, strong families, better future for your kids. You put that together, I think that we can stay on the front foot. We're never going to win the debate, but we can gain the advantage and stay on the offense if we collectively can have a narrative that says, you know what, this is who we are, this is what we want, this is who they are, in a way that makes us all stronger.